Hey everybody, what is going on? My name is DJ and you're back with the Restaurant Growth Podcast by Seven Shifts. On this show, we speak with the best minds in the restaurant business to give you big insights and new ideas on how to help your restaurants grow. Today on the show, we welcome Matt Plapp, the CEO of America's Best Restaurants, where he makes it his mission to help independent restaurants market smarter, get both customer attention and retention by levering social media. Inspired by Guy Fieri and his Red Camaro, Matt and his team have taken vans cross-country visiting well over 1,000 restaurants, which they've profiled on their site and social media pages. Suffice to say, they know what makes restaurants successful from a marketing standpoint. Matt shares his stories, some of the best practices, and ways that independent restaurants can get that repeat business that owners dream of, not to mention retaining staff while they're at it. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us who you want to hear on the show, what you like, what you don't like, and anything else that comes to mind. Just shoot me a message at podcast at sevenshifts.com. With that, here's Matt. Matt, how are you today? I am doing amazing, outstanding. How about you? I am amazing and outstanding as well. So glad you could come on the show today. I'm stoked to be here. We're really happy to have you. So Matt, you know, you could probably do an intro better than I could. Tell us how you got started in this restaurant business of ours. Cool. So I'm the CEO of America's Best Restaurants, and that's what we are now. It started back in 2008 as a digital marketing company called Driven Media. And my concept was pretty simple to help small businesses leverage technology in 2008, which it's crazy to see where it's come since then. But it's also honestly crazy to see how a lot of what I was preaching in 2008 still isn't happening with small businesses. And so kind of rewinding before that, my background started in the late 90s. I worked in TV and radio, a degree in broadcast journalism, communications, and learned on accident about technology. I built a website in 1999 for a family boat and RV dealership that we were creating. At the same time of creating that business, I sold radio advertising. And selling radio advertising, I saw that nobody called on the mom and pop restaurants. And it's kind of ironic because it's where it led me to today. Like I look back, you're like, how'd you get the restaurants? And like, it changes every time I look at it because it started really when I was a kid, my mom and dad had an insurance company. And my mom focused on the consumer side. My dad focused on the B2B side. And he had, I want to say, almost every restaurant in the Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati region, the big name ones in shirt. And yeah. so we always would would eat out. It was never eat at home. It was like, we're going to go to Mike Fink's this night, Barley Corns this night, the Glass Menagerie. It was just, there was a whole list of restaurants that he would go to because they were clients. It was networking and taking care of a client. And so when I look back at my history, it, you know, it started at a young age. I was always at restaurants and they're all independents. And in the late nineties, when I got in the radio, the negative in radio, when you're brand new is that all the good accounts are taking the car dealers, the casinos, somebody already works with them. And so I started looking at things and said, okay, who is nobody talking to? And nobody was talking to the Ferrari's little, like Ferrari, little Italy. It's a one location restaurant in Madeira. Nobody was talking to the Basanos. And so I, Went to them, found a solution that would help them on radio advertising, and that kind of launched my career there. And when I went into consulting with this company in 08, I had a lot of those restaurants reach out and say, Matt, show us what this Facebook thing is. Show us about the internet. Uh, The first restaurant I ever worked with was I went there. A friend of mine shared their coupon on Facebook and this crazy looking burger called the Bardzilla. It was like this big. And I went down there and had lunch because of that Facebook post. Well, I'm talking to the owner. I said, this place is awesome. It's a little hole in the wall. I love what you got. I said, one suggestion. He said, what? I said, well, you currently, your Facebook post that was made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does great. You have a person named Bard's Burgers. If Facebook sees that, they will delete your profile. You need to have a business page. Well, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, I'll help you. Well, what can we do? I'm like, nothing. I'll help you. So we want to do something. I said, give me a free burger. And so that led to them giving me like (laughs) 250 bucks in food a month. And we would handle their social media. And so from there, it kind of ballooned out to where by 2015, we had created a a technique that has since been copied by a lot of people of how to gather customer data from Facebook and Instagram into Messenger through VIP programs. And then, you know, we just ballooned out from there. 2017, we went national and got rid of all of our other clients, car dealers, and became America's best restaurants. And, you know, that was, it's kind of surreal because- Five, six years ago, it was me and a couple, one full-time employee and a handful of part-timers. 
uh, you know, we're hiring two or three people a week now the last three years. Wow. And so we, not a week, but we, we just always are hiring. Yeah. And so, you know, this week I've hired three people and we're up to, let's say we're about 48 to 49 people now with about 15 to 20 freelancers overseas. And we work with restaurants nationwide. It's exciting. That's amazing. Congratulations on all that success. And, um, Thank you. you know, it, it's an interesting journey, right? From 2008 until today, you know, what, I guess I'm curious. So what, what are some of the biggest changes, but also what are this, what are some of the, the constants? What hasn't changed since then? So my last book I wrote called restaurant marketing that works came out late last year. Like, what was that? Yeah. Late last year. And the title of it was supposed to be, I was writing it before the pandemic. It was restaurant marketing that works. Uh, and it was going to be back to the basics 101. Actually, it came out two years ago. I think I can't remember the years are the last two years, is like one, <laughs> one big year. It seems like one month. It seems like, <laughs> yeah. And so we changed the name to before, during and after the pandemic. Cause my mm. publisher called me up and he said, Hey Matt, on the book, we were doing it. He's like, what's changed? I said, what do you mean? Like what you just said, he said, what's changed in marketing of restaurants? I said, nothing. The things we've been preaching for the last seven to 10 years are as relevant today as they ever have been, if not more. Yeah. And it's the same stuff. And so that's where we decided to change the, the title of the book from restaurant marketing that works to restaurant market that works before, during, and after the pandemic for that reason. Because yeah. what we were preaching five years ago, telling your story, gathering customer data, and using the data correctly, is more relevant today than it was then. Because you've got a consu- you got a consumer that's confused. Yeah, and the competition is, is is bigger than it ever has been. I think, especially with all the bigger players kind of getting bigger past few years, and really creating from from what I can see as an industry that's like the big guys and the small people, and the, the divide is even bigger than it ever has been. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the road show that you guys yeah. do. I know you uh, you visited thousands of restaurants more yeah. than in the past few years. How did that get started and, and what's that all about? Yeah, so uh, there's actually one of the two vans are here right now. If you can see that. Ah, very cool. Yeah, there's one of the vans. The other one is in Erie, Pennsylvania right now, I believe, is where I think Luis and, all, and Ryan are at. Okay. So in 2018, when I was traveling, well, like I got them all sitting here, I was traveling, speaking at food shows in my first book. Don't 86 year restaurant sales. And I had a friend of mine recently go, I don't understand the title. I said, good. I didn't want you to because you're not a restaurant person. They understand 86. (laughs) And when I was traveling with that book, I always would say, and this is even more ironic because I just got back from Monday spending the day with Guy Fieri. But I would say back in 2018 that restaurants don't do a good job of telling their story, Mm. that they don't do a good job of telling their story. And there's nobody out there with a megaphone screaming for them. And there was two examples I would always use. I would always say, if you look at Yelp, Yelp is a place that restaurants get a lot of attention. And the negative is they don't control it. And then I look at the other side and I look at Guy Fieri and Diners, Drive and Dives, the most famous personality in the independent restaurant space, hands down. And I used to say, imagine if Guy, I was telling my team, because we have a large marketing team and then we also have the media side now. I used to say, I want you to imagine if Guy looked at that restaurant owner he had just got done talking to and said, hey, I want to... I want to sit down and talk to you. I see some things in your restaurant you could be doing different marketing wise. Would you be able mm. to talk it? There's not one that would say, no, I'm not interested. Right. And so that was my theory was, okay, what if we do those things? What if we figure out a way to create a platform that allows the restaurants to control their own narrative, unlike all the other platforms where the consumers have input? And then what if we create a show that allows us to chronicle the little guy in their journey? that mom and pop independent uh, restaurant in every town. And then at the same time, now that we're doing that, hey, if you need help, our team's behind you, whatever you need. So 2018, I started taking my phone, a tripod, and I would go to restaurants. So when I would travel and speak with the book, when I would go to food shows and have booths, I would find four, five, six local restaurants. I'd have a conversation with them. One of them actually came up in a Facebook memory the other day from four years ago. It was June, you know, yesterday, four years ago at a place called Buzz Bowl Creamery in downtown Cincinnati. And that was one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing that. And I realized that my vision was never going to come to fruition because my long-term goal was for America's best restaurants.com. It was .net back then because we couldn't afford .com. (laughs) to be completely transparent. <laughs> I looked at the amount I had to pay and I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. And <laughs> it's so, got a nice ring to it. Yeah, yeah. .net, I got .net. Everybody likes .net. So back then we had the .net 
And the branding, ironically, wasn't orange and blue. It was gold and black. I was trying to separate the two yeah. and make them look different. Eventually, I realized that was wrong. But back then, I had this vision of AmericasBestRestaurants.net of being a, a place where consumers would go to find local restaurants, mm-hmm. not chains, not franchises for the most part, not some regional franchises, but not like McDonald's and Taco Bell. Right. You find that mom and pop restaurant. And I soon realized that if Matt Plapp was trying to be the Guy Fieri, it would never happen because Guy's been doing it since 2006. And as of last year, I think the number I heard he said in an interview was 1,300 restaurants he had visited since 2006. Yep. My goal is to get 100,000 restaurants on the site. And so in 2019, we kind of shelved it. And I looked, sat it back, said, okay, let's focus on running the company. Let's figure this out eventually because I, I still can't wrap my head around it. Well, by late 2019, I started watching a couple of my employees because I'm real adamant on my employees being involved in the community, be involved on Facebook, on Instagram. When you go to lunch, interview the owner. And yeah. it's funny because people would never do it. I'm like, hey, grab your iPhone, interview the owner. Well, I look and I start seeing two of my employees, Doug and Luis. I'm like, these dudes are better on camera than me. <laughs> like, I think I've become pretty good at being on camera. They're unbelievable. Yeah. And so I got both of them together and said, hey, I got an idea. What if I bought a motorhome and we took turns, drive the motorhome for one week, I'll drive it for five days across the country. I'll stop and interview 15, 20 restaurants. You fly in, you take the motorhome, you leave, Doug comes. That was the game plan. Mm. And everybody's like, love it. Love the idea. Luis is like one problem. I go, what? He goes, I can't drive a motorhome. I can barely drive my car. Like you right. think I'm a maniac driving my Mazda. Like you think I'm going to drive a motorhome. Like, okay, that's a good point. So then I started thinking about it. And we used to be a motorhome dealer uh, back mm-hmm. in the day. And I, I remember the Mercedes Sprinter chassis, you know, the small van yep. that Amazon's got everywhere now. And I said, what if I bought this? And that's the one out here. There's what we call Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's the first one. Our, nice. our vision, we're trying to finalize the number. I think the number that will make sense for our company is about 25 to 30 vans on the road in five years. Yep. So I bought that van, uh, hired five more people. We're up to 15 now just in that department. And they travel to two to three restaurants a day uh, in the different vans to it's a three to four hour shoot. And the whole concept is to help them tell their story. We go in, we, we actually launched some pretty cool things this summer because we t- trialed it out a lot last year. We went, we started in June, 2021 or mm-hmm. 2021. And we went to gosh, I think the first month we did eight seventy eight restaurants, wow. which is a lot. And we had to do a lot of trial and error because I'm a big person. I always say first to fail. Be yep. first to fail, get there fast. The quicker you can get to failure, the better, the quicker you can find the things. And so I started doing that. And when I got to the point last year, we started tweaking it. Now we're at two vans. We had a West Coast and an East Coast van. I realized really quick how hard it was to manage a team on the West Coast. We're in Kentucky, Northern Kentucky by Cincinnati. And it was me flying every couple of weeks out there. And it was just wasn't feasible at this point. So I brought the van back and went, flew one of my employees out. He spent three days driving it back, went snow skiing a couple of places, had a blast nice. and brought it back here. Now both vans run out of here. And that vision is, you know, the right now, the way we're pacing is that financially, because it's not cheap. We spent $700,000 last year on it. And so when I talk to restaurants and they go, well, what's the catch? I've never heard of you. What are you doing? I'm like, yeah. well, you've never heard of us because we're brand new. But right. the name America's Best Restaurant says all you need to know. Like diners, drive-ins, and dives 10 years ago meant nothing to most people that had never seen the show. Yep. If, you're, if your restaurant gets on Facebook or Instagram and says, hey, America's Best Restaurants is coming in a month to film, to film with us, they've never heard of us, but they get excited yep. because the name drips credibility. So last year we did that. We, we, tra- we, we bought the dot – or yes, two years. We bought the dot com. We trademarked the brand. We built out a lot of a uh, lot of branding and, and, and different things of that nature. We built America's Best Restaurants.com. It's a pretty cool site. It's got a map. The colors of the states are orange. We've been to blue. We haven't been to yet. And then I hired a team of five what we call assistant producers that they find the restaurants. And we don't go by Yelp or Google. We go by what we see and then two phone conversations, which lead to a Google Meet uh, or Zoom call and hear the story. And if the restaurants are fit, we propose them us coming out, and then we go from there. I'm curious. You said you kind of just make a couple phone calls. How do you decide where to go? Where are you looking? So we, we've built an avatar. Uh, okay. and the, the, the theme that we use is a restaurant you would eat at weekly. Okay. And I tell my team to think about that. Would you eat at a restaurant that had a banner hanging on the front door for their, their company 
for two years. Doesn't exude a lot of confidence to me if you can't afford to put a sign on your building. Yep. Would you eat at a restaurant that had dirty diapers laying on the floor? So what we came up with is an avatar of what we believe is a restaurant people would visit every week. And at the end of the day, it's what we would visit. You know, well taken care of, updated. Yep. You know, we had a restaurant recently that applied because restaurants can apply to be featured. And one of my producers brought it to me and said, hey, this checks off a lot of the boxes, but there's a couple ifs to my, my, my book. I said, what do you got? Let me, sh- let me look at it. I said, what's your if? He's like, well, those tables and chairs are from 20 years ago. They aren't, they aren't antique chairs. They're right. just shitty old chairs and tables. And I said, well, and I, I leave it up to them. I'm like, well, why, why is that question? I'm like, well, if they haven't spent the money to update mm. the restaurant, is it just a dive restaurant? Is it a dive bar? And there's nothing wrong with it. There's probably good food. There's people with good intentions. But with us, where we're at now, America's Best Restaurants, I want it to be that local restaurant in your neighborhood that's easy to get to, that you will go to every week, that has great service, great food, and a great atmosphere, and somebody in the four walls that cares. Right. Because there's a lot of businesses. I interviewed yesterday on one of our, we have four podcasts, and one of them I interviewed a guy who was uh, Steve Robinson, who was a marketing director for Chick-fil-A for 35 years. Wow. And he talked about, what was different? I asked him, I said, how does Chick-fil-A keep that local ownership feel when it's a national chain, a big one? And he said, because our owners, for the most, I think 90% of them only can own one Chick-fil-A. Right. That is their business. They're inside the four walls, whereas I know a guy that has 28 of this one brand, yeah. and he's never inside the four wall, and it's obvious. And so that was a key element with, to me was I want America's Best Restaurants to be a sounding board for that independent restaurant because there's another side of it. It's going to take a few years, but America's best restaurants.com in about three years is going to be a place that is first on all the searches that consumers are looking at to find restaurants in their neighborhood. And I want that to be filled with places that are, that have owners and operators that it directly impacts versus the millionaire that's got 35 McDonald's. Right. So really focusing in on the, the independent mom and pop owner giving them kind of a leg up on the on the big the big guys or the, the big yep. boys i think as you call it on, on your uh, yep. on your site so i'm curious beyond the kind of i think that's kind of table stakes is you know restaurants that care right because we've all been to sure. one that does and we've all been to one that doesn't how many have you visited in the past few years as a team over a thousand right a lot i mean we've we've filmed at almost a thousand in 11 months wow uh, per, and we've we've visited another four or five hundred in kind of you know if we're out and about like today, Luis and them are up near Erie, Pennsylvania, somewhere, wherever that's at. I don't even know. <laughs> no, it's somewhere near Pittsburgh, but I don't know exactly where. But when they're out and about, they've got a list. We develop a list of about 500 restaurants a week that look ideal across the country. Okay. And when those guys are out there, like they're filmed two episodes today, but they'll stop by five restaurants right. as a customer and shake a hand and look at the place and then get, get on the phone and tell that producer, Hey, yes, this place is a this place looks great. This would be a good fit. Talk to the owner or, Hey, no, take this one off. Like I almost got shot. <laughs> and then from, and then, and then from the marketing side, I've personally outside of America's best restaurants, the road show, I've visited somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 1500 to 2000 restaurants since 2017. Cause I've up until February of this year, I was traveling every other week. Wow. So I'm curious, with all of those those visits under your belt and experience and all that, you've probably been to more restaurants, I think, than probably anybody in the country. Yeah. You know, I, I want to take a two kind of pronged approach to this. So I want to know first and foremost, you know, from a marketing and customer retention, customer service standpoint, what are the restaurants that are cut above the rest? What is the biggest difference between them and everybody else? From a customer service standpoint, and then I do want to talk about some of the employees and the culture and that too. Yeah. But, but first we'll we'll kind of go in the in the customer. So I break restaurants down three ways. Like I had a, a restaurant, this guy's name was Lenny, about five years ago. We had driven about a thousand customers into his restaurant in 60 days through this marketing program that we have. And he goes, well, how do I know they're coming back, Matt? Because that was his question. Like we, we drive them in for the first visit and we don't want to coupon the next two years. We want to bribe them ethically for the first visit. And then after that, it's up <laughs> to the marketing to t- stay in front of them, to retain them. Yeah. And I said, well, let me ask you a question, Lenny. Does your food suck? <laughs> he looked at me really shocked. And I go, does your food suck? And he goes, well, you just ate. What did you think? I said, I think the food's excellent, but I'm also sitting here with the owner and the chef probably knows that. 
He goes, no, our food is excellent all the time. I said, okay, cool. I'll, I'll give you that. I said, what about the service? He goes, well, the online reviews show us like a 4.4 to 4.6 everywhere. I said, okay, that means you probably got solid service. And I said, the atmosphere looks great. If your service is good, your food's good, and your service is good, why wouldn't they come back? And so those are the three big things I look at with restaurants is, is the food service and atmosphere. Yeah. And so on top of that, though, is the, the only way you bring those people back on a consistent, dependable manner is marketing. And so the biggest thing I noticed, uh, and this is gigantic, is that between 90 to 95 percent of restaurants are not actively involved in gaining customers data when you walk in the restaurant. Mm. Number one question you'll get asked, if you go tonight, I promise you, if you and your wife go to dinner tonight and you walk in, let's say you go to a casual dining restaurant, you walk up to the front counter, do you know the three words they're going to ask you? Have you been here before? How are you? Oh, right. They don't <laughs> I was, care. I was hopeful that they would ask if I've been here yeah, before. <laughs> they're going to ask. I, I've, done, I, I've literally have went to 100 restaurants and charted it. 90 to 95 of them will ask you, how are you? Don't give a shit how I am. I don't care how you are. It's a nuanced question. Right. What they should be asking is what you just said. Have you been here before? No, I haven't. Cool. Before we go any farther, we've got a VIP program that you get a free dessert on your next visit. Do me a favor. Scan this QR code. It's going to take you here. It's going to ask you five questions. You're going to get something bonkers that you're going to love. Now let's take you to your table. Mm. 90 to 95% of restaurants are not doing anything to gain the customer's data that walks in their four walls. And that blows me away because my background from when I worked in radio from 99 to whatever it was, 03, at that same time, 99 to 08, we owned a boat and RV dealership. Nobody walked in our boat and RV dealership front doors without giving us their phone number, name, email, birthday. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever fought it. Because if you frame it correctly, if they were in there to buy a boat or camper, it's pretty easy. Hey, before we get, get forward, I want a couple questions to ask. They're going to give them to you. Your name, your phone number, email, cool. What are you looking for? What are you trading in? If they're a customer coming to buy fishing tackle, I want to make sure you're in our, our birthday program because you'll get a $25 gift card for your birthday. Oh, you're kidding me. No, fill this out. We were right. doing that in like, oh, two. Yeah. And restaurants in 2022 aren't doing it. So that was the biggest thing. And the reason I bring that up first is that if you've got awesome food, awesome service and an awesome atmosphere. Why wouldn't somebody come back? Well, they won't come back because you have failed to retain their attention. Uh, Scott, uh, Sean Walsh, F and I, which Sean's one of your guys, yeah. we started a podcast. It comes out June 22nd called Own Their Phones. And the whole concept of the podcast is to follow the journey of my company working with Sean's company to help him market better because mm. he's awesome at digital storytelling. He wasn't awesome at use of data. So we're coming in, we're teaming up, we're going from there. But nice. the concept of the podcast is to own people's phones, be relevant on their email, on their text, on their Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, MySpace. I don't care where it's at. <laughs> but the only way you can do that in a predictable manner is to have their information. And so that's a huge element. So outside yeah. of that, the things that I've noticed as far as the restaurants that stood out, storytelling is a big one. So Back in June of 2020, I went to our tech team. Tom on our tech team is called the Build and Tech Team. They help connect technology for our clients and make sure that customer data comes in from great places, from all the places. And I asked him, I said, Tom, I want you to do me a favor. Go analyze the top 25 and bottom 25 restaurants we work with because we have a pretty sophisticated dashboard that monitors the front end acquisition. We can see if they have 20% conversion rate, meaning somebody... 20% of the people that give us their data walk in the restaurant, they got 2%, how much mm. they spend, all this stuff. I thought he was going to come back with some really cool chart and, hey, okay, restaurants with this many Facebook fans, this many emails, this many texts. Like, I thought he would give me like a roadmap to what we need to do. Yeah. And he came back and he goes, you're going to love this. I go, why? He said, the people that are doing the best are the ones that tell their stories on online. Yeah. The ones that are visible as the owner on Facebook and Instagram. And this past Monday, I was down in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee with a, a downtown flavor town, a client of ours, and Guy Fietti. He's the, the name behind the restaurant. One of our clients, Bucky yeah. Mabe, owns it and created it along with him. And I talked to Guy. We've got some footage coming out soon. But I talked to Guy. I said, it's exciting. I said, tell me, because I, I didn't know his business for a lot of theories. I've seen him on TV a billion times, never met him. And 
I didn't know where he stood business wise. I said, you've got triple D we've got America's best restaurants roadshow. You're doing it on food network. We're doing it on the Facebook page of the restaurants, but tell me 2022, the importance of a restaurant telling their story on Facebook and Instagram. And he was like, Matt, it's what they have to do. Yeah. People don't come in here for the calories. They come in here for the app, the relationship, you know, and mm. then, you know, 20, he said 20 years ago, when I owned my restaurant, when I first got in the restaurant business, you had to buy billboards and yellow pages and maybe radio. And if you were lucky TV, now you don't have to do that. Now you can get on all these social media platforms. And the most important part of all that is the person. And he said something I had never heard before, man, it's so deep. He said, a song means a lot more when you know the story of the artist. Mm. You know, there's a, you know, there's an artist from Kentucky named Jack Harlow, a rapper. And yeah. my son gets a kick out of it that I listen to Jack Harlow. And I don't listen to Jack Harlow because I love his music. I listen to Jack <laughs> Harlow because I know his story. Like yeah. I know the story of him in sixth grade going around his school with 10 mixtapes that were probably God awful, but he <laughs> didn't stop. And that's me. Like some of the videos I did 10 years ago were God awful. And so when Guy said that, I was like, wow, that's deep, man. And like, you think about that from a restaurant standpoint, that was the reason that I supported barley corns during the pandemic. That when we had a choice in May of 2020, where to eat, I didn't go to the Subway or McDonald's or even Chick-fil-A. I went to barley corns. Why? Because I knew the Heil family owned barley corns. And we went there, we got our wings and our Saratoga chips and our French fries and our cheese sticks, and we sat in our damn car in their parking lot and had dinner two to three nights a week on average for probably three to four months. Yep. And it was because I knew the owner. And so that's that's what I think is a huge element there is not think I know is that restaurants need to know that. And by the way, uh, there's a URL. Can I put it, give you a URL which has a lot of stats you like? Yeah, of course. So it's americasbestrestaurants.com slash stats. If you go to americasbestrestaurants.com, you won't find this on the menu. This is a, a, a standalone page. And this page is fed by live stats. Every day, my team have a little holder on their phone. If I go on my phone, I can go on here and I can click this button and it's going to do what's called a restaurant attention audit. And so on that attention audit, it answers six questions about the restaurant's use of marketing. And that's how our team understands if the place is a good fit for us to talk to them on the marketing side. So we started publishing those stats on that americasbestrestaurants.com slash stats, and it's updated. If I go on there right now and review a restaurant on what we see, it'll update the stats. And so there's some pretty cool stats oh. that are kind of scary, but that storytelling also goes deeper. So what's the number one problem the last 12 months restaurants have had in the United States? Labor. Labor, hiring. You know why? A lot of restaurants, it doesn't look fun to work there. I get right. the applications I get all the time here are unbelievable. I had two friends of mine recently who have companies like mine in different niches, but they do marketing and consulting. And they said, man, we can't find anybody. I said, that's because you don't build an exciting story. What do you mean? I said, if I go to your Facebook mm -hmm. and your Instagram right now, there's nothing that gets me excited about wanting to work with you. Actually, it looks really damn boring and it's really self-absorbed. I said, if you go to my Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, you're going to see how I use the Lambo. You're going to see our road trips. You're going to see our Nerf basketball court we put in in the basement. You're going to see our ping pong room. You're going to see our weight room. You're going to see that everybody here wears the orange gear and rocks Jordans and gets Adidas when they start. Like we have shoes you get when you start that match the company colors. We've And we put that on video. And so yep. that was a big thing. I've got a lot of restaurants that didn't have a problem hiring people. Why? Because the owner and the team are always in the marketing, always on TikTok and Facebook. And people that are 18 to 30 years old that were looking for the restaurant space said, okay, I can work at these 20 restaurants. These 15 all are just a job. These two or three right. pay a little more. These two or three look fun as shit. And that's yeah. where they picked. And, and it also goes back to the thing to think about it if, if you worked at a restaurant and you didn't enjoy the day and you didn't have fun time and the culture wasn't great and you went home at night and you had a roommate and your roommate said, Hey man, how was work? Oh, it, it sucked. The owner's a jerk. This happened, that happened. That roommate wouldn't go, Oh, cool. Can I apply? But if you went home and said, Oh, it was great, man. We had a good time. It was a good day. Had some things happen, but man, you know, team's great. The owner's awesome. That roommate 
or spouse or brother is going to go, can you give me an application? Right. And so that was a big thing. And that goes back to what you asked earlier with culture is that how you treat people, how you handle things. We've got this right here. If you can see the money bucket every Friday, tomorrow, <laughs> I go to the bank tomorrow and I'll have to withdraw based on this week's sales. I'll probably have to withdraw about $2,000 cash. I will put the $2,000 cash in here and between tens to a hundred denominations. And my, there's 12 people from our team that contributed to the sales that get to reach into the money bucket tomorrow. At, we're doing it at 1.30 tomorrow. Yep. And so that's fun. And so when they go home right. and their friends are looking for a job and they say, man, on this point, where, how'd you get 300 bucks today? Dude, cash money, the money bucket. What's the money? Have you ever heard of a money bucket at an office? No. Exactly. We definitely don't have that. And, and, and that <laughs> restaurants need it. Like we, I have clients of mine that we've trained on the money bucket that we say, hey, you've got your VIP program. You know, you've got your signups like this. You, know, you got your, your napkins on the table and your server should walk up and go, hey, do me a favor. Scan the VIP, scan the code and join our VIP program. You're going to get an, an awesome gift next week or you know, a free steak for your next meal, whatever it is. Right. And when they do it, they walk back or they, they, they walk back to the other and say, hey, I just got somebody to sign up. Cool. Reach the money bucket. And now that server's out there doing that stuff. They're having fun. They're making more money. They're making cash. And then it's benefiting the restaurant by getting that sign up that I mentioned never happened. So those are little things with culture. Outside of that, I'm not an operations guy. So uh, I don't really critique service. And I think it's been impossible to critique service because even for me, the best restaurants still have had some limited capacity with regards to what they could do the past couple of years. But those are some of the biggest things I've seen in the restaurant space. Absolutely. I, I'm curious about this kind of gathering, like the VIP list, you know, the napkin you just held up with the QR code on it. Something I've been talking to a lot of people lately about uh, in the past couple episodes, our last episode with um, Phil Crawford. He, he works as uh, technology's chief yeah. technology officer for, for Carl's Jr. Hardy's. Oh, cool. They talk about loyalty. You know, the, the big, the big players in the, in the industry is everyone has an app now yeah. and they're getting really good at it. Yeah. You know, Starbucks is great at it. McDonald's is great at it, you know, and they're getting that loyalty, but, I think the average restaurant can't create an app and they that should. competes with that, but they don't need to, right? No. So it seems like these are the kinds of things that the mom and pops, the independent restaurants can approach loyalty in a different way yeah. because at the end of the day, you're competing with the, the big players. Yeah. You know, So what are some of the ways beyond the kind of the napkin that you recommend, you teach, or that you see restaurants doing to get people back in, in, yeah. in getting them on the list and then utilizing that list well. So, so number one, I'll, I'll address the, what they, they say the elephant in the room. If you're an independent restaurant with, I'll say under 20 locations, don't waste your time with an app. I eat out all the time. I'm not downloading it. People, yeah. the, the people that have apps that do great, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, Dunkin', the big boys that have massive money, that people eat at all the time and they just dump a lot of money into that process. But I'll also say this, like I eat at Chipotle. I don't have their app. I'm not a big app person. And so if you're an independent, you're a small chain, you're a small brand. The app isn't where it's at. We actually just have a, a client. We work with a, a franchise that's on there. They're switching to their third app in four years. Wow. And it was kind of comical was they were hardcore pushed at about a year ago. Well, always hardcore pushed about a year ago. They're telling one of our, our locations that we help gather email and data and drive a VIP program that they needed to get quit doing that and just focus on the app, focus on the app. And I said, what are your, what are your sales? What's your pull through on the app? She's like, it's between eight to 11% depending on the month. I said, what's your pull through with what we do? 35%. Interesting. <laughs> so they spent tens of thousands of dollars over here on something. And the reason that is, is number one, people don't want apps at the end right. of the day. The other thing is that about 60 to 70% of the people that we see that walk into the restaurant are new or lost, or they're an infrequent <laughs> guest. And so yeah. they're brand new and they're infrequent. If they're brand new and infrequent, they are not doing an app. They aren't even doing a loyalty program. If they're a frequent customer, yes, they will do a loyalty, they'll do a loyalty program. If they're a frequent customer that's hardcore, yes, they'll do an app. But that, that's 10% of your audience. Like I've not seen... Yeah. A, a, a mid-sized to smaller chain yet be above 14% when it comes to that app usage on their, on their, their customer sales. So what we look for is there's three places we preach restaurants need to find data. Now, first, our acronym we use for America's Best Restaurants is ABR, Attract, Build, Retain. So mm -hmm. there's three main places you can attract attention. You can attract attention on your website, 
You can attract attention on social media. You can attract attention in, inside your four walls. Inside mm -hmm. your four walls is the most important. On your website, it's the second most important. And in social media, it's third most important. Everywhere you attract attention, you should be leveraging it to gain data. So it's Father's Day this coming Sunday. And this right. week, a lot of our clients, like almost all of them, haven't been doing Facebook posts saying happy Father's Day coming for the brunch. They've been making Facebook posts with a picture of them and their dad and saying, this is mm. me and my dad. Here's a memory about us. By the way, drop your memory below in the comments for a chance to win a $25 gift card. And next thing right. you know, a hundred customers comment. The reason I say that is that we have that hooked up to automation that takes the mm. conversation to the messenger and says, hey, Matt, thanks for your comment. By the way, I see you're not a member of our VIP program. Click below to join and get four free offers. And wow. so you've got social media tactics like that that can build a database. You've got your website. If I go to your website, the only places I typically see restaurants have way to gather data is when I order food. But what if I'm there mm. just peeking and looking? You ought to have right. a pop-up that boom, bums my face and says, get a free waffle. Hell yeah, free <laughs> waffle. Click it, give you my data, boom. And the big thing with when I say that, people are surprised how many customers will do it. Customers will give you their information when you position it correctly. Matt, you want mm. a free waffle? Yes, I want a free waffle. Great. Click here. They go to Messenger. Here's your free waffle. Don't be, they come to Messenger. Hey, here's your free waffle with a purchase of nine entrees, two drinks, and you have to name <laughs> your kid after us. Right. And I heard something the other day on the uh, Restaurantopia podcast. You ever listen to that Restaurantopia? With the guys I'm familiar with it, yeah. Yep. So- Anthony, I think, is who said it. He said, you know, consumers become loyal to a restaurant with free. They become loyal to a coupon with a discount. Meaning mm. when you keep giving coupons out, like in these lame magazines, that you consistently, like this restaurant, this is actually a friend of mine's restaurant. It's in here, I'm sure. Actually, it looks like a different one. But he, he's got a coupon here the last 10 years. 10 off 30, right. last 10 years. Doesn't listen to me. I'm like, dude. Everybody that's using that coupon knows it's in there. They use it every month. Your customers are, you're, you know, you're cannibalizing your profits from it, but yeah. they're addicted to the coupon. Whereas if it said a QR code and said, scan this for a free X, a free offer. It's like, here's this, the turf club. That actually is a client of ours. So the turf club's got in here, five off any order, free burger. If I'm him, which I'm going to text him, actually one of my managers going there tonight, <laughs> I, I'll end up, I can't make this stuff up. I'm going to take these out and put a giant QR code and say, want something amazing and free? Scan me. And there's the QR. Mm -hmm. They scan it because if this person gets this and they do this six times a year, they can always use that free burger and you don't know who used it and you don't have any, any way of having their data. You have that QR right. code. They go into your tool. Whatever We use Messenger, whatever that you use. They go into there and now all of a sudden you can get their information. And every time they see this, this ad in the future and they scan it, it notices them. Hey, Matt, welcome back. We see you used your free burger, but you have a dessert available. Or, right. hey, we see you've used all your VIP offers. We appreciate your loyalty. Click here to go to our website and see what's going on. I mean, you can do a lot of different things with it. And so when you gather data, you've got to look at all of your inroads, your marketing in-store, which I would consider that kind of an in-store marketing element your online marketing, your social media. So inside the restaurant, the, the biggest opportunity is your servers. If you're a casual dining restaurant, let's imagine you and your wife. What's your wife's name? Rachel. Rachel. So you and Rachel are having dinner. You just, what's your favorite food? Uh, I mean, I'm Italian. You're Italian. Italian so you, you just crushed giant fettuccine, Alfredo, <laughs> bunch of bread. You're full. And the server walks up to you and shoot me straight what you would say. Server walks up. You guys are full. You got the meat. You got sweat through eating so much. They walk up and say, uh, hey, Rachel, you, you guys in for dessert? What are you typically saying? Probably I'm too full. You're too full. You know what? You are. You, you crushed that fettuccine Alfredo. Sorry, I saw you. You that, definitely that, are. That was delicious. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it was. I want you to do me a favor. Have you ever had our cheesecake? It's the bomb. No, I've not had it. Okay, here's what you do. If you scan this code. And you go to Messenger, go ahead and do it. Well, I'll do it with you. Take your phone out, scan the code. You got to do it with them. Right. It's going to ask you five questions. It's going to have you enrolled in our VIP program. You're going to get a free right. dessert and a couple other offers for your next visit. When you mm. come in next time, you got that cheesecake for free. 
And so now what happens is you just, cause what that conversation usually is, is, Hey, are you guys in for dessert? No, we're full. Okay. I'll get your check. Right. I call that my, she's my cherry pie. We call that the warrant. <laughs> We've got names for our different call to actions is that you teach the servers that technique instead of going, okay, I'm going to get your check. You yep. are full. You crushed it. Let me do you a favor. I want you to have a free dessert. And then what happens is that person, now you have their email, their phone number, you have them pixeled and tagged on Facebook and Instagram. Right. You follow them around for the next two weeks. They come in your restaurant. They use their free cheesecake. They have that delicious cheesecake. And now their next 20 visits, they buy the cheesecake. Right. So you not only had a good engaging conversation on that visit, you not only got their data, you not only drove a future visit that was more predictable, but now you've just upsold a piece of cheesecake. La Rosa's Pizza is a pizza brand down here in Cincinnati. About seven, eight years ago, they did a cookie promotion. I didn't know they had cookies. Like it's a pizza place. It's delicious. We go there. We get, we had a free cookie promo. And I'm like, we'll have our free cookies. They brought three of them out. Amazing. Made in the pizza oven. They were fire. We get the cookies every time we buy La Rosa's. I had a ping pong tournament at our office about two months ago. I ordered mm -hmm. 27 cookies for the team on top of a bunch of pizzas. And so that's yep. 27 cookies. I think it's like $5.99 for three. So I ordered whatever that is, 40 or 50 bucks in cookies off of a free promo from like seven years ago. Wow. And you're still getting them. Still get them yep. every damn time. Yep. I mean, I, I tell you, my favorite, one of my favorite restaurants, my favorite restaurant here where I live here in Brooklyn, Park Slope, shout out to the Double Windsor. Just neighborhood bar and grill. It's everything done right. They have specials every week. They have a new draft list every week. I probably go twice a month. If they just texted me the specials and they texted me the new draft list once a week, yep. I'd be in there every single week. What's your what kind of beer you drink? Uh, I'm I'm like a I, I like the more like Mexican lagers, you know that kind okay. of stuff. Okay, so let's let's say for example, the next time you're in there, that server walks up and says, "Hey, how much <laughs> change is in this growler?" That's almost planted, isn't it? I keep it here. How much change is in a growler? And you're like, I don't know. Do me a favor. Scan the QR code. It's going to take you to Facebook. Answer. Just guess on it. You've got a chance to win a $100 gift card, whatever. Right. So now you do that. And then you go to, when you scan that code, you go to that post and you comment. It opens up in Messenger and says, hey, thanks, Dominic. Appreciate you guessing on the contest. By the way, you want to join our VIP beer program? You want to join the Beer Tasting Association? Right. What's Hell that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You say yes. You go in there first so we can get your membership activated. Answer three questions, your, your email, your visit frequency, and your phone number. As long as you lay it out what they have to answer, they'll do it. And then after you answer that, what are your top three beers? I'm a Mexican lager. I'm a Hef and I'm an IPA. Right. So now in a month when a stout comes out on tap, they don't bug you. Right. But in a month when they get some new imported Mexican lager in, you get a text message that says, Dominic, you're going to love it because you're on the VIP beer list and you love Mexican lagers. Right. We just got XYZ in. Can't wait to see you soon. You're walking in the restaurant. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> and so you're, and I, I use this number, it's called, I call it 600 friends. You know, if you owned a restaurant, the most frequent customers would be your close family and friends, right? Yeah. So it would make sense that if you could develop a, a group of 600 more friends, you would have a more successful restaurant. So what I always talk to customers about is using tactics inside your four walls on your restaurant's website and social media to grow that 6,000 person annual list. There's no way in heck, there's no way you can't find 10% of those people to be awesome friends. And if you find them to be awesome friends and you use that data, it's not hard to drive six more visits a year. 600 people at 600 visits is 3,600 visits a year. And let's just say it's an average check of $3. Let me go to my hand calculator here. <laughs> 3,600 times $30. That's $108,000 in gross sales minus, let's say you got food costs of, of 30%. So now you're down to $70,000 and you've already got your electric. You've already got your water. You've already got your staff. You've got all of your costs already there except for the food cost and the marketing. So you just probably turned $50,000 in profit simply by engaging people correctly, getting their data, getting a depth of data so you can segment it by lager and IPA and stout yep. and hef. And then you talk to them more often. Absolutely. And just engaging with people in, in, in a more meaningful way and making sure you're, you're getting there. You're not just asking, hey, give me your phone number, right? 
but you're, you're, you're giving people value. And I think that's yeah. the key to getting, getting people in. You know, a lot of these times you download a restaurant's app, you know, download our app, free fries, whatever. That's yeah. enough for me to download something, right? But yeah. I think on the local standpoint, there's a lot of room to grow. I'm curious, you know, we're getting out of time here. You know, I, I kind of like to understand a little bit of like the diagnosis. Why do you think restaurants have been so far behind on this? Why do I, I think they're afraid to, they're afraid to seek outside help. Mm. You know, the number of restaurant owners that called me, Matt Plapp, the marketing guy, you know, I'm not an accountant, right? You have a pretty good understanding of that. During the pandemic to talk about PPP and idle loans. Mm. Matt, t- tell me about this PPP. I, thought, I saw you did a webinar. It was pretty cool. Explain the PPP. To, this is, I literally got this call every day for three months. And I'm like, do you not have an accountant? No. You don't have a trusted banker? You're, you're a trusted <laughs> person for financial advice on the pandemic as a damn marketing person? Right. And- I think a lot of restaurants are so busy working in the business that they have failed to work on the business. And when you work on the business, you have like this conversation five years ago, Matt Plapp was the only salesperson for our company. I had operations out the galore. It was just me selling everything. And I did 30 or 40 sales calls a week and I did probably five podcasts a week. Mm. Now I do maybe two sales calls a week because we got 12 people and I do probably 20 podcasts a week. Right. I don't work in the business anymore. I work on it. Working on it is spreading our word like this. Mm. A lot of restaurant owners can't get out of the kitchen. And if they can't get out of the kitchen, they can't study their craft. If they can't study their craft, they can't identify that marketing company that's out there that can help them become more digitally savvy. They can't identify the tax accountant that should be their go-to person. Yeah. And when you can't identify those person, you don't do it. And that's a big problem. And so why a lot of these restaurants aren't tech savvy is because they've never taken the time to educate themselves or hire people like me. This is, this is my bookshelf of restaurant books. Those are all restaurant focused books. Yep. These are the seven books that I read on a quarterly basis. I read the seven, say or eight books now, same eight books, because mm. they're the only eight that I need to make my business better at every angle. Yep. And when I talk about reading to a lot of my restaurant clients, like I haven't read in 10 years, <laughs> like you, you've got to. Yeah. You got to keep yourself educated and keep yourself on the pulse and really just take that time out of your business to step away, even if it's for a day, just to really think about things. And it's a challenge. It definitely is. But I think it, it just takes the kind of intent to to want to do that and to, and to say, look, I need to step away. How can I do that? You know, maybe I just need to trust somebody else for, for a couple hours to, to handle it. But yeah, I think I think that's that's a big part of it. It's just not enough time out to be able to look, you know, step outside of the restaurant and say, let me actually think about this because it is such a challenge to run a restaurant. It takes so much energy and so many hours and so much effort. So with that, I have I'll just tell you, I'll, no go. I'll go tell you ahead. a real quick quick story. The last two Fridays, I went to Nashville two weeks ago for my son's lacrosse tournament. I went to Columbus, Ohio last week for my son's lacrosse tournament. I visited two restaurants that have done business with my company. I don't know either owner. Yep. I texted my team member and said, hey, can you let them know I'm coming by? I just want to shake their hand. I'm not there for a free meal. I don't take free meals. Right. I mean, I've been forced to them, but I'm just there to shake their hand. That's why I was giving them business because they've given us business. And so I stopped by the restaurant in Nashville and the owner in an hour and a half has does not have the ability to leave the kitchen and come say hi. Mm. The next Friday, this past week, I go to a restaurant up in Little Italy in Columbus, Ohio, near Columbus, Avery. Not only has time to leave the kitchen, he hangs out for 20 minutes, talks to me. Yep. And he tells me, he's like, Matt, I want to thank you. It was kind of ironic. He goes, I want to thank you. I go, well, for what? He goes, from you, I found David Scott Peters. Mm. I started following, I don't know if you know David Scott Peters. Is, but DSP is a yeah, he's been on the show. He's on the show back in, uh, in March. Guy's fire. Unbelievable. He said, from you, I found DSP. I went down the rabbit hole of watching 100 DSP videos. He now is my coach. I do his system. He goes, Matt. I can, I work five hours a week in the restaurant right now. Nice. From That's putting the, his the systems dream. in place. That's the dream. And that guy is now able to work on his business. He's able to analyze, hey, I can put, I need to put napkins out like this. I need to do this. His restaurant was spotless. It was up to date. It was, it was up, up there. The servers were, were happy. The food was excellent. The other restaurant I went to was average on everything. Yep. I mean, it, it had the potential to be great. But the owner's in the kitchen. 
And if he's in the kitchen, he can't work on the business. And that's the key is not working is working on the business and not in the business. Yep. With that, I think we're almost at time here. I have one last, last question. I've been wondering since we started talking about the van, have you taken the van to Hawaii? No, not yet. <laughs> That's uh, it's funny you said that because I actually interviewed uh, you, Bill Tobin. Is I'm not familiar, no, but I, I will definitely so look him Bill up. Bill owns a tiki restaurant in Honolulu, wherever Honolulu is at, whatever island that is. Yeah, it's the large. I believe it's the largest independent restaurant in Hawaii. Wow! And he's got a book, and he's got a podcast, and he's awesome. And he's joked about that. Yeah, because. My goal is to have 25 to 30 vans to where in five years, there's vans roaming around the entire country. Yep. And he's like, you realize that means Hawaii. I'm like, I know I got to figure that one out. There's a bunch of islands. So we <laughs> might do a tricky. boat. Maybe we do a boat that would in be, Hawaii. Now that would be interesting. An amphibious vehicle that just goes yes. island to island. And goes like the, the ones yeah, that have we, in, uh, in Boston. We, we will get to Hawaii. I might have to take like a cardboard cutout of the van and stand in front of it. There you go. I think you can make it happen. But with that, um, we're almost at time. So... Matt, thank you so much for coming on. A lot of great advice to take back to the restaurant. America's best restaurants.com. Um, and where else can people, can people shoot you an email, find you? Yeah, my cell phone's the easiest way to find me. Uh, yeah. 859 743 2408. All right. 859 743 2408. And then awesome. my website, you got also mattplap.com. So Excellent. reach out. I'm an open book. I love helping people. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Matt, for, hey, for fighting for the independent restaurant owner. Um, and, and helping them uh, get back, um, you know, and, and really compete in this in this crazy market. So thanks again. Cool. Thank you. Thanks again for checking out the Restaurant Growth Podcast presented by Seven Shifts. We're so grateful to our listeners and we'd love to hear from all of you. Send us an email to podcast at sevenshifts.com and check us out on social. We're at Seven Shifts on all platforms. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next week.